verse being 16. Why was it necessary for Christ to humble himself even unto death? Because, with respect to the justice and truth of God, satisfaction for our sins could be made no otherwise than by the death of the Son of God. Why was he also buried? Thereby to prove that he was really dead. Since then Christ died for us, why must we also die? Our death is not a satisfaction for our sins, but only an abolishing of sin and a passage into eternal life. What further benefit do we receive from the sacrifice and death of Christ on the cross? That by virtue thereof our old man is crucified, dead, and buried with him, that so the corrupt inclinations of the flesh may no more remain in us, but that we may offer ourselves unto him a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Why is there added, he descended into hell, that in my greatest temptations I may be assured, and wholly comfort myself in this, that my Lord Jesus Christ, by his inexpressible anguish, pains, terrors, and hellish agonies, in which he was plunged during all his sufferings, but especially on the cross, have delivered me from the anguish and torments of hell. This Lord's Day, beloved, that we read together, explains three elements in our Saviour's humiliation, as per the Apostles' Creed. Namely, he died, he was buried, and he descended into hell. And these are, as you will recognize, very pertinent truths as we come together this morning to partake of the Holy Supper. Earlier in the worship service, we read Hebrews <coughs> chapter 2. This is a very deep and rich chapter of the Word of God, and Lord willing, we will deal with it more fully in our Wednesday night Belgic Confession class, because this chapter, like Hebrews 1, has a lot to say about angels, which is our subject for the last couple of weeks, and for the next few weeks too. This morning, we're only going to look really at one part of Hebrews 2, verse 9, and more particularly the latter section of that verse, which states that the Son of God, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. This is, according to this word of God, what our Lord Jesus Christ was doing when he died, was buried, and descended into hell, he was tasting death. He was tasting death for us by the grace of God, and that is especially what we remember at the table this morning. Christ's tasting death. Its meaning, its beneficiaries, and its source. Christ tasting death. What does that mean? Who benefits from it? And where did this death of Christ come from? It's meaning, beneficiaries, and source. Christ's tasting death means, first of all, that he actually died. We need to start with that. Christ's tasting death means that he did not merely pretend to die, or that he did not just appear or seem to die to other people, but that he really and truly died. This is the way tasting death is used in the Bible. First of all, I'm thinking of Mark 9, verse 1. Jesus' words to the Jews, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, 
which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come in power. <coughs> By that Jesus meant that for some of you here who will not die but be still living, that is, you will not taste of death until you've seen the kingdom of God come in power, which kingdom of God came with power, the power of the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter 2. Even more conclusive is the use of the phrase tasting death in John chapter 8. In John 8, the Jews quote Christ as saying, verse 52, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Verse 52, and the next verse explained that taste of death means die. The Jews said to Jesus, Now we know that past the devil, Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And yet you say, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Then they go on to add, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? This passage very clearly teaches that taste of death is the same thing as dying. By the way, <clears throat> Jesus says, if a man keep my saying he shall never taste of death, doesn't mean that he shan't physically die, for he shall, unless Christ returns first. But tasting of death here means tasting of death as a punishment from God that crushes and destroys and ushers us into everlasting punishment. And that is what the scripture teaches as summed in question and answer 42. Since Christ died for us, why must we die? Well, our death isn't the sort of death by which we're satisfied from our sins or being punished. Our death is the abolishing of sin in us so we no longer sin. It's a passage into everlasting life. Lord's Day 16 goes on to explain the reality of Christ's death by stating that Christ was buried, question and answer 41, thereby in part to prove that he was really dead. And of course, the signs and seals of the Lord's Supper teach us this too. <coughs> Because we are presented not merely with bread and wine, but broken bread, symbolizing the broken body of our Savior in death, and wine which is poured out, which speaks of the shedding of Christ's blood, which exited his body. He died. In this statement that Jesus Christ tasted death doesn't only mean that he died, that's the first thing it means, but it means more especially that he experienced death. We all know that it is possible to eat and drink without really tasting. That we consume our food and drink quickly and without thought, bolting it down much the same way a dog does, we don't experience its flavor. We don't taste it. This is why it says that Jesus Christ tasted death. That he not only died, but he experienced it and felt it. That's the key thing emphasized here. And our Savior tasted death over a long period of time. His whole life some 33 years. He did not taste death in one swift, quick draft where the fire was over in the blink of an eye, but the shadow of the cross rested upon him always. He was the Lamb of God bearing away our sins during the whole of his humiliation for over three decades. No one
tasted death in this life for as long. And the taste of death became a stronger and stronger taste for him when he was installed and ordained by John the Baptist at the River Jordan and as his ministry progressed. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he experienced the taste of death even more terribly. And we should think of it like this too when we read the narrative of our Saviour's passing away into the next world in the latter chapters of the four gospel accounts. He was feeling and tasting death as he was scourged. And when the crown of thorns was thrust upon his brow, while he was hanging on the cross, he was tasting death. And most particularly, during the three hours of darkness. Then, he actually, physically, and in its most literal sense, died. He expired. By an act of his own will, he gave up his spirit to God. In his soul, his death was his passing from this world to heaven. In his body, he ceased to live. So that the human nature of the Lord Jesus was rent or ripped in twain. Our Lord tasted death. He didn't swig it down in one go. He didn't gobble it up in one bite. He tasted death his whole life long. Not only though did he taste death for his whole life it was nothing but a continual death. He was always in the process of dying for our sins, but he consciously and deliberately experienced this. He thought about his death. He anticipated his impending death. He felt his death for 33 years and with increasing intensity. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in the darkness, he was, more than ever before, conscious of the horror of his death. And of the seven words from the cross, this one is especially about tasting and experiencing death. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the taste the experience of death here is the taste of God forsakenness. There's one element of our Savior's <coughs> crucifixion which teaches us, as it were, that he could have chosen, in a sense, not to experience or taste death as fully. This is the idea of the wine mingled with myrrh, which was offered to him and which he rejected. Because he must not take a painkiller or a sedative to ease his suffering so that he wouldn't experience the agony so badly, he consciously, deliberately says no to it so that he can taste death in all of its awful terrors. To explain further, we may say that in tasting death, our Savior experienced and consumed it in all its bitter ingredients. This is an aspect of tasting too. The Lord Jesus didn't merely sip the cup of death or 
gave a little nibble at the corner of it. He tasted it so as to consume it, all of it, and every last bit of it. And we know how it is with tasting too. If you taste, eat, and enjoy, let's say, a stew, you can taste the ingredients. You say, that bit's carrot. That's, that's the oniony bit. That's, that's beef. You can taste the ingredients in what you eat. Or what you drink. So what were the ingredients that the Lord Jesus tasted in his death? Well, he tasted this. He tasted his death as a punishment from God. He knew, I am being punished by the Most High. He knew guilt in this concoction too, because he was guilty, reckoned guilty, for our sins which were imputed to him. He tasted condemnation, because Jehovah sentenced him as worthy of death because of our wickedness. He tasted the wrath of God because of our iniquities. He felt the curse, Jehovah's curse lying heavily on him. He experienced separation from God, divine abandonment. And all of these ingredients were perfectly blended in the infinite pain and suffering and terrors and agony and misery of the cross. He tasted death. This is what our Lord was referring to when he spoke of the cup which his father had given him. Terrible cup filled with all sorts of awful ingredients. He tasted it. He tasted it as the one who drank that cup to the dregs. An infinitely bitter taste. A painful taste. Repulsive. And he drank it. He drank it because he loved the God who he served and he loved the people on whose account he was drinking the cup. <clears throat> the cross, the Lord Jesus explained, was the meat, that is the food, which the Father gave him to eat for our salvation. It needs to be said too that this tasting our Lord did on his own. No one else tasted it with him. With regard to our Lord's redemptive sufferings, it was not the case that Mary sucked a little of it, but he finished it off. It wasn't the case that the angels joined in, even just a little, or that the people of God took a swig. But the Lord Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath alone and entirely. Why was it necessary for Christ to humble himself even unto death and to drink this cup? Answer, because with respect to the justice and truth of God, satisfaction for our sins could be made no otherwise than by the death of the Son of God it had to be this way. He, the Son of God, must taste death. But who then are the beneficiaries of Christ's death? Hebrews 2 verse 9 states that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. 
The first thing we should say here is that it means literally should taste death for ever. There's no Greek word for man in the original. The question then is, he tasted death for every what? For all of whom? The context is very, very clear. It's good to underscore this because Hebrews 2 verse 9 is one of a handful of texts which is most quoted and abused by the Arminians who want a universal and ineffectual death of Christ that hangs on the miserable free will of fallen man. This kind states that Christ, by the grace of God, tasted death for every what? Well, look at the next verse, which begins with four, which gives the reason. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. Sons. He died for every, for it became him to save his sons. Not illegitimate. Hebrews 12 talks about illegitimate ones. His sons. The sons are not the sons of the devil, because they're a different sort altogether. And in John 8, verse 44, Jesus says to the Pharisees, by extension to all the ungodly, you are of your father the devil. You're not a son of Abraham. You're not a son of God. You're a son of Satan. You'll notice too the word many in verse 10. He brings many <coughs> sons unto glory. Not every single individual human being head for head, but for many sons. And he brings to glory. These are the ones for whom Jesus tasted death. The next verse, verse 11, also begins with the word for. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Christ dies for every, every son, the many sons who he brings to glory. And those who are sanctified, every last one of them. And they are sanctified, we are sanctified because Jesus tasted death for us. His death, especially the book of Hebrews, is our sanctification. But not everybody sanctified. And that same verse 11 goes on to say that they who are sanctified of them, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren. Brethren. And Romans. 8 verse 29 says that those whom God did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that that was so that Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. The predestinated are the brethren of Jesus Christ. These are the ones for whom the Lord shed his blood. Verse 12 has Christ saying, here Christ is quoting Psalm 22, which speaks of his sufferings on the cross. I will declare thy name, O God, unto my brethren. Same word. Then it goes on to say, in the midst of the church, the congregation, the church means those who are called out of darkness into God's light according to election. I will praise thee. And if you think that I'm laying this on thick, and explaining it very closely, you're dead right, because we want to nail this air and explain for whom Jesus shed his blood. The next verse, 13, has Christ saying, Behold I and the children which God hath given me. Behold I and the children. These are the ones for whom Jesus died. He tasted death for every one of his children. Behold, I am the children which God hath given me. And God gives Christ his children in the eternal degree of election. And when the Father effectually draws those chosen ones to Jesus Christ in time. In verses 14 and 15, 
These are the children who are delivered from the power of the devil. And, verse 15, they're delivered from subjection to bondage and slavery to sin and Satan. Christ chased the death for every one of them. And in verse 16, each verse keeps explaining these ones for whom Christ tasted death, the captain of our salvation. In verse 16, we're told that Christ took on him the seed of Abraham, not the seed of Adam, but the seed of Abraham. And the seed of Abraham refers to Christ and all those who are in him, according to Galatians chapter 3. Christ tasted death for every man who is a true spiritual seed of Abraham, whether Jew or Gentile. And to give you one last verse, going through each of these in turn, verse 17 says that Christ, at the very end, made reconciliation, made propitiation, bore wrath in our place, so that God is no longer angry with fury against us. He made reconciliation for the sins of the people. The people is the people of God. Those, we, are the beneficiaries. So if you look at Lord's Day 16, you should notice the personal pronouns. Answer 40. Satisfaction for our sins was made. Question 42. Christ died for us. Answer 42. Our death is not the satisfaction for our sins. Question 43. What further benefit do we receive from the sacrifice of Christ on the cross? And answer 43 says that by virtue thereof, our old man is crucified, dead, and buried with him. So the corrupting inclinations of the flesh may no more be in us. These are all benefits, things purchased by Christ's death for his own, so that we offer ourselves as a sacrifice of thanksgiving. That's all the collective, the plural, we, us, are. And in, ver in question and answer 44, it becomes most personal, moving to the individual Christian. He descended into hell. This means that in my greatest temptations, I may be assured and wholly comfort myself in this, that my Lord Jesus delivered me from the anguish and torments of hell. That's the idea. If you want to learn more about the confessional teaching of the beneficiaries of Christ's death, Canons of Dort, head to of the death of Jesus Christ for his elect people. Hebrews 2 verse 9 says then that Jesus Christ by the grace of God should taste death for every one of his children and brethren, everyone who is sanctified, every one of God's people of the seed of Abraham. The word for, he tasted death for every man, means first of all, he suffered and tasted death instead of all of us as our substitute and in our place so that he having tasted death we will never have to taste and drink death oh yes explain as I did earlier we'll have to die physically unless the Lord returns first but our death is not a punishment in fact God cannot punish a Christian he may cause us to suffer, he may chastise us, but he doesn't punish us because Jesus bore all our punishment. So our death isn't in any way a satisfaction for our sins or even punishment. It's sin abolished in us, answer 42 says, so that we have a passage by God's grace into eternal life in the next world. Tasted death for every one of his people instead of us. And 
through that suffering instead of us. It's for our benefit. Since he tasted death for us, and we are the beneficiaries of that death, then we have the forgiveness of sins, communion with God, everlasting glory, or as verse 17 puts it, a merciful and faithful high priest in heaven interceding for us, caring for us. Benefit is a good word to use too because question and answer 43 states, what further benefit do we receive? As we get all these benefits, well, what more benefits do we receive from the sacrifice and death of Christ on the cross? And then it goes on to explain, if you look at this more fully in Lord's Day 17 this evening, that by virtue of Christ's death on the cross, our old man is crucified, dead, and buried with him, so that the flesh no longer reigns in us, so that we can offer ourselves as a sacrifice to God. You could put it slightly differently and say that the Lord Jesus tasted death for us, so that we might taste, in a sense of experience, and enjoy life. He tastes death, that we might taste life. Which is life of God, abundant life, and eternal life. You could even say, well, this is biblical, Jesus Christ tasted death for us, that we might taste God. Not with our physical mouths, of course by faith. Taste here meaning as it has done throughout this study. We may know and experience and enjoy Him. And I say Scripture teaches that we taste God because of the exhortation in Psalm 34 verse 8. O taste and see that God is good. Blessed is the one that trusteth in Him which verse in its first half is quoted in 1 Peter 2 verse Three. And this tasting and seeing that God is good is knowing and experiencing the Father, which is life eternal, that is knowing God through Jesus Christ, as John 17 verse 3 tells us. Tasting too is an appropriate verb for us this morning because of the Lord's Supper. We taste and eat bread, real bread, true bread. We taste and drink wine, all of it. And we do this, to use the language of Hebrews 2 verse 9, as a sign and seal of Christ's tasting death for us and for our salvation. And in closing, lastly, we notice its source. Hebrews 2 verse 9 says that Christ, by the grace of God, tastes death for every man, all of his brethren. He does this by the grace of God. Unmerited favor eternal everlasting pity and God says I'm not willing, I don't want them to suffer I can't have them, my beloved ones bearing my wrath drinking this cup for all eternity I will send my son to do it in their stead in place of them as a substitute so that they might receive all the benefits of the everlasting covenant of Grace. This too is signified and sealed to us in the Holy Supper.